The Climate Project, a changing landscape, is brought to you by National Grid. New England possesses a charm that's drawn people for generations. Quaint main streets, sprawling farmland, miles of beaches and rocky coastline. It's also a region feeling the effects of climate change. It's like this, up, down, up, down, cold, hot, way too hot, way too wet, way too dry. Those effects are increasingly noticeable in areas humans deeply rely on. We lost our roads, we lost infrastructure. Water, agriculture, health, and energy. In our next half hour, we're exploring the impact on our environment and how communities are looking ahead to the future in The Climate Project, a changing landscape. The impact of climate change extends beyond an increase in temperature. Extreme weather and sea level rise are growing concerns for New England. A study by the Union of Concerned Scientists found that by the year 2045, nearly 7,000 homes in Massachusetts will be at risk of chronic disruptive flooding, totaling $4 billion in property value. That has realtors and property assessors taking notice. We are seeing some of the fastest rates of sea level rise in the world here on the East Coast. There are real properties in the path of this sea level rise, and we all have a real stake in this outcome. This flooding does not depend on storms. It does not depend on rainfall. It's completely independent. It just comes as a result of variability in high tide. In Massachusetts in uh, 2045, so again, within the lifetime of a home mortgage issued today, uh, we're expecting 7,000 homes to be flooding on average every other week. Even if uh, a home in, on this street remains dry, if the roadways are flooded, if their neighboring homes are flooded and their property values are affected, the whole area is impacted and property values can be hit. We had a property on Montemoy Island that was listed for $2.795 million that went on in the fall. Beautiful beachfront location. In March, when we had the four major nor'easterns, the basement flooded out. It diminished the value of that particular house. We did finally sell it for $2.3 million. The sellers realized that the value probably wasn't going to go up, and so that's a good example of what can happen. It goes well beyond the homeowner. We could see properties chronically flooded that contribute a significant share to the municipality's property tax base. And of course, that's the budget that funds schools and emergency services and, and infrastructure upgrades, a whole range of things that the entire community depends on. The community as a whole is going to need to rally around this problem and begin to do some really thoughtful planning. Provincetown has this incredibly unique pattern of development where we were so inextricably tied to our harbor and everything is based around that. We need to make sure that we maintain that character and stay a viable community. This is Commercial Street, the cultural and economic lifeblood of Provincetown, but it's just steps away from the beach and the ocean. And when that water comes in, it floods this alley right into the downtown area. When we're, um, you know, thinking about this street, we can't just retreat. So we have to come up with proactive solutions to uh, deal with these things. Right now you're kind of lifting piecemeal, but eventually that may happen on a more broad scale. Yeah, so, you know, I, we're, we're seeing um, some structures having to go up, uh, you know, one, two, three, four feet. But we actually recently had a case where um, because of the uniquely high base flood elevation, and the low nature of the site, we have a structure that has to go up over nine feet. So late this century, they're looking at 1,300 homes facing chronic inundation. Uh, this doesn't include commercial properties, uh, of which there are many, certainly, along Commercial Street. Those represent a third of Provincetown's homes and about $780 million worth of current property value. This beach is actually accreting, meaning it's gaining sand, but it's growing longer and not growing higher. People might hear dune and be like, okay, well, who cares about a dune project? But when you see where it is, literally as the first line of defense for all of the property just on the other side, it actually is a big deal. It is, absolutely. And uh, the, the state is encouraging uh, this kind of nature-based solutions uh, to, to, to the issue of sea level rise. A seawall here uh, could exacerbate flooding in other areas. It could drastically change the uh, contour of the beach. Essentially, uh, what we're looking to do is raise the profile of the beach 
to avoid flooding in most cases. So we need to make sure that we are um, planning to preserve this place, make sure that we are here for hundreds of years to come. Preparing for climate change takes the whole community, a term developed by FEMA, which means engaging residents and businesses, as well as local, federal, and state government. That's where MEMA comes in, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. So we really take the lead in working with our federal partners, but in also educating um, all of our constituents, our communities, and our residents, thinking about ways that while you're rebuilding after a storm, even though it might be a little bit more expensive to rebuild stronger or higher or larger, it's sometimes better to make that investment now. Recognizing the need to generate solutions, the city of Boston launched Climate Ready Boston. The team released a report in 2017 outlining strategies to protect the most at-risk neighborhoods of Charlestown and East Boston. In each of those neighborhoods, we were able to identify an immediate action that the city could take. Um, in East Boston, this was installing a deployable flood wall across the East Boston Greenway. This is a, a former uh, rail line, and so it's very vulnerable not only to flooding, but to serving as a conduit for water to get into the neighborhoods and to flood the neighborhoods. And we were able to identify a spot that if a about seven foot high deployable flood wall was installed in advance of a storm, we'd be able to protect 99% of the areas behind the wall. We've seen studies through the FEMA programs that for every dollar we spend now in mitigating a future hazard that we can get up to six dollars in return. We also want to try to focus on ways in which we can use nature-based solutions to promote natural development. The longer range um, recommendations that are coming out of these reports really look at the entire waterfront and how does the entire waterfront become a cohesive system of flood protection. Back in the 1980s and 90s, there was talk of building a seawall from Winthrop to Hull, but a recent UMass Boston School for the Environment study found that it wasn't feasible or cost effective. This outer barrier, you know, the harbor wide barrier, so expensive that their benefit cost ratios, the amount you invest compared to your return is less than one. But these shore based solutions, they're very cost effective and moreover, they have all these co-benefits. Instead of like building, let's say, an ugly gray flood wall to protect an area like right here, we would try to do something to make it attractive, like maybe create a playing field, like something over there, except elevate it more. So it creates open space, green space for this community, which obviously needs it, but it also, if it was elevated correctly, would also protect against flooding. Rather than a seawall, these local plans can be scaled up or down depending on the actual sea level rise. As oceanfront communities face a flood threat, inland towns are finding themselves just as vulnerable. Research shows we're getting fewer but heavier rainfall events. Ann Brower lost her quilt studio when Tropical Storm Irene inundated the village of Shelburne Falls in 2011. So it came off the foundation and started to move. Where did it go? Oh, it was very graceful. It picked itself up. And you see the quilt studios floating. It turned around, trying to decide if it was going to float, and it went down oh. river, down to this little park here, where there were a couple of maple trees that sort of held it. It's grounded, but all the water's right against it now. The power of the water was phenomenal. Uh, it was just rolling down and the roar, I imagine, the sound. The sound, intimidating. Even, even when I got back in town, the sound was there. Um, it took out all sorts of gas tanks. It went through sewer systems. You know, whatever it saw in its path, it took out. Residents were left reeling. With over eight and a half inches of rain, the small community was sliced in half by the Deerfield River. The water came through here you know, and sometimes splashed over. So on the other side of this, you know, there was debris caught on the pilings of the arch between that and, you know, and then it went under the iron bridge, but it caused substantial damage. It was pretty scary. People were scared for a while. I mean, they really were concerned that they were going to lose this bridge. Buckland is like a lot of towns in New England. Valley locations surrounded by mountains. In torrential rain, that water gets rushing right into the center of town. So in that sense, with the changing climate, it's almost inevitable that you will get big flooding. It took us several years to actually recover even 
on the ground. Um, and during that time, we tried to make sure that we were coming back smart, that we were looking at things, that we were taking advantage of programs that would allow us to upgrade or improve and uh, in cases where it was possible, not just necessarily put back something that we felt could be uh, damaged again. So we did a lot of planning, we did a lot of discussion, we did a lot of training, um, including our emergency management personnel and town officials. We said, where are we vulnerable? We identified a bunch of key areas. So the state allowed that process to happen by giving the funding to allow those agencies to come in and lead us through those training. And then they've stepped up since then and said, once you've had your resiliency plan approved, then we are going to have some funding for people to act on the outcomes. For a small town like Buckland, funding can mean the difference between resiliency and vulnerability. We have many small bridges and culverts are considered anything less than 10 feet. And um, there's a culvert program. It's very small but we just got a, a grant to do the engineering on one, and it's 91000 to do the engineering. We have a very small tax base, even with a few businesses. It's a pretty small tax base, so we are pretty dependent on what the state's putting forward, and they have come up with some new planning. Back in the day, flood insurance wasn't required, um, and uh, it took a few rounds of insurance companies getting blasted with huge costs, huge price tags, huge bills, uh, to say, you know what, we're not going to do this anymore. You're going to live in a, a, a flood-prone area, like a, a velocity zone or in a, a one, one in a hundred year zone. Marina Brock teaches emergency management and environmental protection at Mass Maritime Academy. For her, Shelburne Falls is a shining example of how communities can become climate resilient. I think that volunteer efforts or community groups that band together can do a lot, you know, and what is your community worth from that standpoint? Other, other avenues would be thinking outside of the box for funding. Uh, FEMA and MEMA offer mitigation grants. Uh, I think magic can happen when people get together and, and really have a passion to, to make things better. I mean, I've seen it in disaster response. You know, people aren't paid to go out and help their neighbor, uh, yet they do, you know? People aren't paid to go and, and provide food for people. I mean, you see the goodness of mankind in a lot of these things. Mankind's reaction to rising temperatures and evolving rain patterns will have a lasting impact on future generations. Still ahead, a look at some of the dramatic changes farmers are seeing and how they're taking action. Plus, the new species of tick that's becoming an everyday reality when the climate project, a changing landscape, continues. Here in New England, our modern identity has been shaped by generations of living off the land. Of course, when your livelihood is tied to the earth and sky, a changing climate means changing rules, changing expectations, and changing keys to success. Julie Rawson and Jack Kittredge of Many Hands Organic Farm in Barrie, Massachusetts, have been farming in the same spot since 1982. Julie has experienced firsthand what research has also noted. Changes in climate have come with more extremes in temperature and rainfall. Up, down, up, down, cold, hot, way too hot, way too wet, way too dry. And that just puts them under constant stress all the time. So I think under our changing climate, it's going to be harder and harder for people to grow food consistently. So there are no peaches in Massachusetts in 2016, particularly in the fall. The seasons are longer. The numbers bear this out. Since the 1950s, our New England growing season between frosts has increased by 27 days, nearly a month of extra growing from a generation ago. Now from April 21st to October 19th on average. We can grow more things into the fall, essentially. That's what we can be sure of. But this year, for example, with that um, six weeks of pretty much rain every single day, we lost a lot of crops to fungal diseases. An increasing number of hot days and decreasing winter chill days will put more heat stress on some crops, making them more difficult to grow. Similarly, changes in rain patterns are already impacting crop water management, eroding topsoil, opening the door to new pests, and altering the quality of livestock grazing land. But a change in climate doesn't have to be all bad. So with an extended growing season, and particularly a later first frost date, cucumbers are doing well deeper into the season. Same thing with Brussels sprouts. Summer squash has just been planted. Normally, it wouldn't have been planted this late in the season 20 years ago. Broccoli is doing well, and peppers are producing deeper into the season than ever before. An intelligent farmer or gardener these days is to really take super good care of your soil, which means, again, 
you know, stopping the tilling, doing everything you can to build the soil organic matter, keeping the soil covered, and all this mulch is on here to keep everything in the soil. When you till, you volatilize the carbon in the, in the soil and then release it into the atmosphere. But the tillage is really a, a very dangerous for the climate balance. We want to plant plants differently, sometimes different ones. We want to do more with perennials. We can develop some perennials, as has been done by plant breeders, so they produce more things that are popular and tasty, and that probably take 50 or 100 years. So we think that there's a real message here for gardeners, for small-scale farmers. Here's an opportunity to do this kind of farming. Not only is it, is it good for the climate, it's also, truth be told, the way you raise healthy crops. The transformation of our land has consequences that go beyond affecting our food source. Here in New England, communities are paying close attention to shifts in the tick population, the types of diseases they carry, and their exposure risk. It's absolutely true that particularly in Massachusetts, we have seen changes in the types of um, mosquitoes and ticks, the species that we have here in the state. And there's no doubt that climate has a role to play in all of this. And I think for both ticks and mosquitoes, there, there are two factors that are really important. So one is heat, but the other piece of it is precipitation. In Massachusetts, we've seen populations of that deer tick, also known as the black-legged tick that spreads Lyme disease. We've seen that in Massachusetts for decades. But as the temperatures warm during that same time period, we've actually seen our neighbors to the north, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, they're seeing populations of the tick, and they're also seeing the diseases that that tick can spread. If you look at something like Lone Star Tick, and if you look at the distribution map of, say, 40 years ago versus today, this that thing has been spreading steadily north. We've been seeing populations of that tick become established in Massachusetts, so we now actually know that it is breeding here. We do know that the earth is getting warmer, and there are a number of ecologists that think the spread of Lone Star Tick is a function of climate change. The new thing that it brings is that some people, when they're bitten by the Lone Star Tick, they will develop an allergy to the protein in the tick saliva, which then also makes them allergic to red meat. So when they consume red meat, they may have an allergic reaction. Experts explain that tick-borne diseases have been around for years and years. It just took the combination of a higher risk of exposure and more reported bites for researchers to learn about their risks. People aren't probably being bitten by more ticks than they used to be, but they're more likely to be bitten by an infected tick. During the fall into the spring, we have adult stage ticks. And on average in our research, we find 50% of them are packing that bug that causes Lyme disease. And the nymph stage tick is the one stage that's out during the summer months. And they're about the size of a poppy seed. And we find that on average, about 20% of them are infected. But if you look at the statistics, that stage of the tick during the summer months causes 85% of all tick-borne diseases. And now we have these emerging diseases like anaplasmosis and babesiosis and uh, recently uh, relapsing fever and even more recently Powassan virus. Most of those tick-borne diseases are, are actually um, easily treated by antibiotics, so that's the good news. What's a little more complicated with ticks is that we don't yet have good tools to help reduce those tick populations kind of on the, the broader scale. Don't be afraid of your environment, but understand your environment. Up next, the push toward renewable energy. How towns, utilities, and homeowners are reducing their eco footprint with solar power. The realities of climate change have many communities turning toward green energy. This year, New England reached a milestone. On a sunny April day, solar power output reached a record high, driving down electricity demand. It's a trend playing out in private homes and small towns. So when you were a young man, were you thinking, uh, someday I'm going to build a solar power plant on Cape Cod? I had absolutely no idea. So what's below our feet here? Right here, there's a, it's a capped landfill. It's basically everything that you know that you saw when you were younger. My Tonka truck that I had when I was five that I threw away when I was 10 is down there. Absolutely. Pretty special to come back here considering about 45, 50 years ago my dad took us and the boys here and we dropped our trash on the ground. There were little fires burning, gulls were working and now it's the capped dump and there's an efficient landfill adjacent to an incredibly productive solar farm. 
There's approximately 23,000 panels here. To be able to utilize a space that you couldn't utilize for much of anything else, basically turning lemons into lemonade is, is just awesome. And even on a cloudy day, you're generating electricity. Absolutely. Anywhere between 6 million and 7 million a year kilowatt hours. Um, and um, we're really pleased with, the, uh, with what we've been guaranteed and uh, what the output has been. Uh, the thing I'm really getting out of this is even on a gray day, electricity is being generated and depending on the scale, whether it's a house, a, a parking lot, or a whole town array, uh, it's contributing despite the weather. This is our four kilowatt solar panel system. It generates, if I had to take a guess right now, 80% of the energy that we use throughout the year. If there's anything that I did wrong in the beginning, it was that I'd make it bigger. We almost have no electric bill. I've had bills that are in negative. I've gotten a bill from, uh, from National Grid that says negative $63. Solar is still a relatively new industry in the big picture. We certainly help customers in, in the interconnection process. So when they put in a solar system, they would be looking to us to connect that to the grid. The homeowners are contributing to the grid as well as using from the grid. Yes. We're all helping to make this a clean energy future a reality, whether it's putting solar on your rooftop or uh, buying an electric vehicle, because that is the largest emitter for greenhouse gases. We're very much focused on, on changing that equation uh, by promoting uh, electric vehicles. Does solar play a role in that? Solar does play a role in that because you could uh, envision a facility with a solar panel connected to energy storage where you can harness that extra energy that you might be producing and use that energy to charge your electric vehicle. Like that carport at Roxbury Community College. Yes, that would be a great example. Funny, one of my first jobs ever was pumping gasoline at the mobile station right on the dump road in Dennis. And now look at this, you can actually get fuel from the sky, thanks to the solar powered roof here, Roxbury Community College. People really like solar in the state of Massachusetts. It, it pulls really well, even people who can't put it on their roofs want to have it in their communities. I think it's forward thinking governments that have made it possible for people who own homes and for people who have some land to put these kinds of projects up. One of the things about Massachusetts is that we are a leader. We have historically been a leader and we show what's possible. Massachusetts was a leader in banning smoking and we can be a leader in the clean energy revolution, but we have to pull up our pants and do it. <laughs> As the impacts of a changing climate become more visible, New Englanders continue to take steps toward preserving their way of life, nature, and the resources we all depend on by learning to adapt. We have to start thinking about these things now. And so time is becoming a factor. Taking some action or any action as opposed to no action, um, whether it's an individual, whether it's a group, whether it's a community, band together and address the issues. The community as a whole is going to need to rally around this problem and begin to do some really thoughtful planning. The Climate Project, a changing landscape, is brought to you by National Grid.